So, yep, we are live. Let me see if we're... Good afternoon, precious family. Welcome to another beautiful Saturday. Wherever you're listening today, so you're joining us live from. Hope you're having a fantastic Saturday. It's been raining in the UK. Yeah, and we're on the lockdown again, but we're keeping the spirit up. Today on Inspirational Moment, courtesy of Precious Pair Charity, we have a very lovely guest who will be talking to us about overcoming childhood traumas. And it's, it's something that we all need to actually listen and try and assess what we are and try and adjust because the thing is this if we do not heal ourselves we pass this on to our own children and it becomes a vicious cycle so we need to learn how to break that cycle so as usual i've got my lovely lady Tolu with me and she's going to introduce our lovely guest hi everyone lovely to see you guys thanks for joining today it's been a couple of weeks um but yeah we're here Thanks for stopping by today. Um, we have a lovely, lovely guest with us today. I'm just going to read her bio in a few minutes. Her name is Asia Carroll. She has a wonderful story. I actually um, first saw um, a post about her on Facebook, and I was I was really touched and really blessed. And I thought, okay, let me reach out to see if she can come on board, Precious Pearl, and you know just talk to us a little bit about what she's gone through her life and how she's been able to overcome some of our struggles. So someone, um, I think Leeds said to me just before we started that someone said to you that, well, what do you, what's today going to be all about? What do you guys do at Precious Pearl? Um, we are a Christian charity and we're all about empowering our world. So we say that we empower our world one person at a time and everything that we do, our outreaches and our programs and everything is about, you know, adding value to that one life, one person at a time and empowering them so that they can be a better person. And so our inspirational moments is, is with different, it's from different, um, we, we talk to people from different aspects of life. We talk to people in business, how they pull through in business and um, people that have gone through trauma, um, loss, you know, you know, just, a varied background of um, fantastic people. And we also have on board today another fantastic person. I'm so glad she said yes to coming on board to join us today. And she's um, joining us all the way from North America, from the United States of America. Um, a lot of our guests have been from the UK. We have had a guest from Africa and um, see we're trans we're going across the globe. God is awesome. So um, who's Asia Carol? I'll just read that bio and then I'll pass back the button on to Elizabeth so she can carry on. She's our hostess and she's been our hostess and she's been doing a fantastic job. Asia Carol is the CEO of Survivor Not By Chance LLC. She has a bachelor's degree in business administration from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Asia, um, Asia is a certified life coach, author, mentor, advocate for childhood trauma and consultant. Bear with me guys, I'm going to be reading this um, to you. She has clients from across the globe with various backgrounds and experiences. She's mentored teenagers and young adults for over 15 years. Asia is also an advocate for children and adults affected by childhood trauma and domestic violence. She volunteers to educate the community about racial injustice and systematic oppression in minority communities. Asia Carroll brings a unique um, perspective because she's very transparent and uses her own traumatic experiences as a tool to help others heal. Asia is the author of the book, The Pressures of Becoming a Diamond. And congratulations on your book, Asia. That's one of the things I saw online that caught me because, um, you know, uh, we have this inspirational moment, we call it inspirational moment for diamonds and pearl. And it's obvious that you're shining as a diamond and also you've authored a book about becoming a diamond. It's an autobiographical novel about challenging life experiences with homelessness, neglect, abuse, 
and abandonment. So I hope you can, you know, share with us the link. I'll get the link of you so where people can go and buy that book from. So we'll put the link on here so people can go and get the book. Um, I'm sure it's an amazing read. So that's Asia Carol. Thank you, Asia, for joining us. And over to you, Elise. Thanks, Jalu. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Like I said earlier on, um, when I welcomed all our, our online guests, I said it's something that, you know, childhood trauma is something we need to deal with, we need to heal from, because if we don't, it becomes a circle, a vicious one at that as well. So thank you, Aisha, for, uh, Aisha for saying uh, yes to our request and for coming on board. So want to know a bit about yourself and the program you've got up and running that you're working with teenagers and children, what does that look like? You know, how does that look like? What, 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 what is involved in that? So um, I just wanna say first, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be um, selected to be here today. Um, in regards to my program, the name of my program is called Encouraging Young Champions. And I created the program almost two years ago now. And it took about a year in development, creating the course, um, you know, meeting with the administrators and things like that. And so um, I had to stop the program due to COVID. But now I'm going to go and move into a different direction in regards to virtual, um, virtual courses for the program. So primarily the goal and the reason behind the program was to help children who are affected by childhood trauma. And um, a lot of schools, they have children who are affected by trauma. And when children are affected by trauma, they act out. And a lot of times when they act out, they have a lot of expulsions, suspensions, and disciplinary actions, which lead them to being basically transformed to another school. And so I wanted to create a program to lessen the number of expulsions, to lessen the number of children being transferred from one school to another, causing more trauma. And so the way I designed the program is um, it's a program to help young students or even older students basically learn how to deal with um, their emotions and teach them healthy coping me mechanisms like meditation, you know, speaking about what's happening in their um, life, um, finding a resource or person, a, a family member, a friend or teacher or guidance counselor, someone they can confide in to get them help and resources that they need giving them information about microaggressive tendencies with teachers, family members, and um, um, teaching them how to acknowledge when um, they're in a situation that may not be healthy, but it's normal to them. So for example, if they're seeing domestic violence in the home, I give them tips and tools of what red flags would be for domestic violence to help them going forward. So if they get in a relationship, they'll understand this is a red flag. This is going to lead to domestic violence. I don't want to get myself in this situation. And so it's just basically creating a healthy dynamic, a healthy environment, a safe environment for students to feel comfortable to uh, release these traumas that they're experiencing. Yeah, wow. Well, thank you so much for that. So it's them acknowledging what they're going through and also finding ways to cope with it. So also teaching them emotional intelligence as well, exactly. because it's not from what you've just said now, I think it's not just the kids that need it. Some adults oh, actually yeah. do. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> they got a lot of angry. Seriously, I yeah. tend to stay off social media because they got a lot of angry. When I say yeah. angry, angry people, they cannot even communicate without yes. being aggressive, abusive and constant. Yes. And I'm yes. thinking, geez. What is going on? So we've got a lot of hungry people walking around, which I've not dealt with whatever they, <laughs> has happened to them right. in the past. So they, they need this emo emotional intelligence course as well. Uh, so, exactly. <laughs> so I think that we should be referring some adults for this as well, not just the kids. If the adults, oh, yeah, adults, sure. if the adults can get their, their, you know, their, their emotions under control, it will help the, the children as well um, to cope better. Thank you so much for this. 
You're and welcome. congratulations on your new book, Becoming Thank a you Diamond. Thank so much. <laughs> I've linked so, the bio, so check it out on Amazon. The Precious of Becoming a Diamond. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you so much for that book. So I'm just going to say, you know, what made you write that book and what impact are you hoping for that book to have to whoever picks the book up? Okay, so I was a teenager and I think I was probably like between 14 and 16. And I knew my, my life was not normal. I knew how alone I felt. And even now thinking back to that moment, I have these emotions that's coming up. Um, and so I felt so alone. I felt abandoned. I felt hurt and pain. And I said to myself, I cannot be the only person in the world that feels this way. I know it's other people that feel the same way I feel, but I don't know anyone who's, who's expressed it. And so at such a tender age, I decided to myself, I wanted to write a book to help other people who may have these feelings and emotions that they don't know how to deal with. And I always knew I would make it out of the poverty situations that I was in. I didn't know how or when, but I knew one day I would. And so I wanted to be that light at such a young age. I don't know why, (laughs) I guess it's, well, not I guess, I know it's my purpose, but at such a young age, I knew I wanted to give some hope to people, inspire people to know that even though these are challenges, even though these things has happened that are horrific, you can get through it and you can move forward. And so last year, uh, I think, no, 2000, I think around 2007, 2008, I started writing and I wrote maybe like five pages and I lost the computer. (laughs) You know, I just was like, oh boy, what am I going to do now? And the computers from then are completely different than the computers now, you know? (laughs) So um, last year I decided to be completely intentional and I created a podcast and I created the podcast with the intent for it to be a precursor to my book. I did not know I was going to make the book the following year, but I intentionally made sure that I set myself up in a mental capacity to prepare myself for writing the book. And the podcast, it was different chapters of my life. Um, And I used it as a tool to help me mentally prepare for writing the book. And I'm glad I did that because it was very resourceful. It was very resourceful. Um, And so my goal is to help that one person, whether it's a child or an adult, to help that one person, whether it's a man or a female, to help that one person who feel hopeless. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good you actually mentioned your podcast because I'm I'm going to come to your podcast in a bit. Right. And on, on one of your podcasts, you talked about conquering fear, you know, and from experience, people that have got any kind of trauma, fear is the first thing that holds them back from getting healing. Yeah. So can you tell us a bit about this? So was your traumatic experience part of the fear or that, you know, of, you, you said, you know, that you're going to come out, but you don't know when. So did that actually help you back in a way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Even when I created the podcast, I was fearful. And that was one of the reasons I think that's one of my first episodes, fear, because I was so afraid of judgment. Mm. I was so afraid of being ridiculed. I was so afraid of people's opinions. And I had to get over that fear of people's opinions because regardless of what you're doing in life regardless of your accomplishments there's always going to be judgment there's always going to be fear and as a human being we naturally don't want to be judged we naturally don't want someone to have an opinion about our lives and what we're doing 
but there's always going to be an opinion. There's always going to be judgment. It's how you deal with it and how you handle it. And so um, there are a couple of different things that people who have childhood trauma experience. And anytime a trauma comes up, most of us react in certain ways. And it's either we flight, which is flee and leave. We can freeze, which is we just stop and we don't have a response. Mm. Or we can, um, I think it's flight, freeze, and um, oh, I can't, uh, just the other one escaped me just now. Uh, but basically, you have a, it's different ways that you can choose to respond to your trauma or to respond when you're triggered by trauma. And, oh, and, and, and fear. Um, I personally have been afraid my entire life. Living in the home I was in, I was afraid. Living in the environment I lived in, I was afraid. I literally was a ball of fear walking around. And so I had to conquer that. And if you don't conquer your fears and you don't, um, acknowledge that you're fearful you won't be able to move forward to your destiny and to your next level where you need to be that's so true that's yeah. so true you fear because of what you've gone through exactly personally mm. yeah it's not just what you've gone through as well is you know you're thinking if i speak out people might judge me people might say it's like in a society now we know a lot of people that have been raped, but they wouldn't yeah. say it out loud because right. people say, what were you putting on? Why were exactly. you there? Not addressing the issue, you know? And there's so many things. People will say, I, I, I know that for a fact that people that have been, that have gone through domestic violence in their marriage, right. and, you know, right. they're still staying put in those marriages, not because they don't want to, but because they're thinking, what would people say? You're, you know, you're a divorcee or something like that, you know? Exactly. And then, so some background doesn't even support that to be honest they don't support right it right even, despite it being an abusive marriage so it's it, that fair is it goes a long way about yes. what will people say what will, how would the society judge me how people judge me or how am I going to begin all over again because some people when when they leave like for example an, an abusive marriage uh there has to be you know there'll be a loss financially to be honest mm -hmm. and they have to like start all over again start building things from scratch some people haven't got the i think because they've they've fought for so long they've lost that real power to yes. fight anymore so there's a lot of things that actually in that fair yeah so i guess it's learning what it is because i remember um that i worked somewhere where i was literally scared to death of my boss i was afraid and i was afraid throughout the time I worked there and mine was to freeze so I froze throughout my period of working there I didn't react to anything even if the um, owner of the business has walked to me and had said to me you know what do you want to get a promotion I wouldn't have said yes that's how right. I just wasn't you know and I didn't realize it then it was much later thinking back on that I realized oh, gosh don't you were so afraid throughout all those years mm. you know like I, I I couldn't really progress in that environment because I was so afraid right and so, fear will block you from you know doing anything mm. um once you overcome that it's okay to be afraid moment and whatever happens as a result, it's okay. I know me personally, I was afraid that people were going to say, why is she using her trauma as a way to make money? Or why is she using mm -hmm. her trauma as a way to get fame or you know, to publicize who she is? And that wasn't my intent. And I know God knows my intent. And so whatever ideas or judgments people try to bestow on me, that's fair for them. That's okay. Yeah. But my intent is to help others. Yeah. And so as long as I'm helping people, I will continue to share. Amen. <laughs> so I love I'm the way that some people say that a mess is meant to be a message to someone. So yeah. everything that we've gone through in our lives, through our in our life for a reason isn't it so that we yes. can have a message to help somebody and if you're not happy with that that's your problem and that's on you <laughs> right true true so i'm gonna ask a question sure so what 
can we, as maybe friends, family, siblings, you know, do to help someone that is going through a traumatic experience? So, for example, I know some people that are either in an abusive relationship or, you know, they're going to want to know the other or, you know, growing up, they were traumatized, they had a traumatic childhood, you know, what can we as friends, family, siblings and stuff like that do to help them? Because sometimes we cannot do anything until they are ready to get mm -hmm. out of that state. But what can we do in the meantime to help support them? And I was just going to say that um, some people aren't ready to share. Some people aren't ready to leave the abuse. Um, it's a lot that goes behind childhood trauma. It's a lot that goes behind domestic violence and abusive relationships, even in abusive friendships, people don't talk about. No. And the part of it is that person who's experiencing that abuse, they're manipulated. And a lot of them are brainwashed into believing they deserve that abuse they deserve that negative treatment is that what's called gaslighting <laughs> yes exactly exactly and so um as a friend or family my suggestion would be to now mind you i'm not a doctor i'm not a psychologist i'm not a therapist and i always like to say that just to cover myself, you know, but um, I would suggest that you just be as supportive as you can. Let them know you're there. Don't force your beliefs or judgment on them. Don't um, overwhelm them with saying, you need to get out. You need to leave. You need to get out. You need to leave because it's just going to push them away. The most important thing is to just affirm them, continually affirm them. Um, Send them daily affirmations. And little by little, it may seem like they're not reading it, they're not receiving it, but just the same way someone's in a narcissistic abusive relationship receives those negative inputs each day and then they start to believe it, the same will go for positive affirmations. Mm. And every person has a cup. And I believe that um, if, and then I use this analogy for everything, if you have a cup that's empty, you can't pour anything out of it. Mm -hmm. If you have a cup and you put it in the sink and it's a little drip coming from the sink faucet, that's just coming down into that cup. It's going to take a little bit more time for that cup to get filled with drops going into it. But those little drops, eventually that cup will overflow with time. Yeah. So just continue to pour positive affirmations into that family member or that person. And little by little, their cup will start filling up and it'll give them the strength they need to leave. Thank you so much. So another question, what sure. if the traumatic experience has got a major, major effect on a child? What can adults around those children do for example, um, some of us had uh, a very, very traumatic childhood growing up where they felt like corporal punishment is the best way of straightening our heads. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> they feel like beating the living daylight out of right. a child is the best way of correcting a child or actually getting a child um, uh, to pass in school or something like that. So if this is happening to a child. What can the adults around those without, you know, because I know for a fact that some, when that is happening to a child, some adults might try to speak to the parents, but they're not ready to listen. They feel like they're, bug, you know, badging in on their family, trying to tell them what to do to their child, blah, blah, blah. Or mm -hmm. as adults around the children, what little, little things can we do without, you know, interfering too much of being saying that we are trying to like, tell the parents how to, how to do things. What can we, as, as adults around this year, maybe as an aunt, you know, to that child, or as a school teacher to that child, or as a Sunday school teacher to the child, what can we do? So it varies. Um, it would depend on the severity of the situation. Um, it would also depend on your relationship to that child. 
-hmm. So there are several different ways you can go about it. I have had cert certain experiences for myself growing up in situations where it was not safe and we were homeless. And so um, there were people who tried to step in to help. But like you said, sometimes parents aren't receptive because they don't think they're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. So you can try to have a conversation with the parents. If they're not receptive, then try to have a, convers a, a conversation with the child, depending on your relationship with the child and depending on the child's age. So say, for example, if the child's 14 years old, you may be able to have a conversation with the child compared to if that child is seven years old. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a family member, you can, um, and you've spent time with that child, try to pick the child up and take them to the grocery store and get them their favorite fruit or vegetable or, you know, chips or something like just showing them compassion in that way. That can go such a long way. Um, another thing, you, if you're a teacher or an administrator and this child is in your school, then there are legal things that you must follow because of um, child, uh, child abuse laws, um, depending on where you live. Every country is different. I know here in the United States, um, if, a ch if there's suspected abuse with a child, Child Protective Services would be notified and it can be an anonymous report. Um, but sometimes that can be great and sometimes it, it's not so great because mm -hmm. some children are taken away from their families and then they can be put in worse off situations. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful when it comes to when children are being abused and how you respond. Do some research where you live. Um, you know, in the UK, I'm not really familiar with child protective services and how the laws are. Look up the laws, see what um, resources are available. See if you can reach out to the parents and say, I found this big sister, little um, brother program, big sister, little sister, big brother, little brother program. And I want to give you this resource. Will you enroll, say, Sally Mae into this program so that she can just, you know, get some other opportunities? So, so many various ways that you can go about it. You just have to be very careful and make sure that whatever way you go about it, you're, you know that that outcome may be good and that, that outcome may be worse. Hmm. Well, <laughs> can I ask a question as well? Sure jumping i just watched um, a very sad video last week about mother and she lives in africa anyway so i know it's a bit different in africa whose son but i think the signs are the same everywhere whose sons committed suicide mm -hmm. and um he was a bubbly child a very active fun loving child and then suddenly um, he started sleeping the grades started to sleep in school and then they changed school and it didn't get any worse. She said that the, the son seemed even shocked to find out that he, he failed woefully in the new school. And then from then on, he was just very withdrawn and really different from his jovial self. But, you know, this she got the other kids, the other siblings to talk to him and, you know, give him pep talks. And she thought that would be okay. But unfortunately, it wasn't because one day she found him, one of the kids found him. Um, he had hung himself in the balcony mm -hmm. and it was very traumatic for the mom. In fact, I really felt so sorry and that it's nothing that you ever want to see, you know, and she kept on saying to the young people out there that were listening and she's like, you know, if you listen, there's nothing that you can't deal with, that you can talk about, that you can't, that you can get over as a child, as a teenager. You know, when you're a teenager, it feels like mm. your world, you know, when something little happens, it feels that's the end of it for your world. So what advice do you have to parents of teenagers and young people, what to look out for, what definitely not to overlook, and how to help your child if you feel like they're sleeping and they're different, you know, you, you know, you're just so worried. <laughs> what, what will you advise? Well, first, I want to send my condolences to that family, whoever they are, um, and I want to send healing power and um, comfort and peace to that family and every other family that are affected by childhood trauma as well as suicide because that is something you will be traumatized for the rest of your life you cannot get over that but you can learn healthy coping mechanisms I will say 
when you have teenagers, it is very important to have communication, effective communication with your children, even more so. Um, I personally believe in affirmations and I speak positive affirmations to my children every day, multiple times a day. And remember, we were just talking about that cup underneath the sink and that, that faucet just slowly dripping into that cup. And if you leave it there, if it takes a month, yeah. that cup will overflow. It may not overflow at that moment, but it will. Learning how to acknowledge when there is a challenge or when there are situations happening with your children and you know you just cannot get to them. Yeah. We need to normalize going to counseling. We need mm. to normalize allowing a life coach to step in to give your children holistic tools to help them get through their emotions. We need to acknowledge and normalizing allowing our village, whether it's a mentor to come in to have that person give and implement positive affirmations into your child while you're implementing positive affirmations into your child. I honestly believe meditation is an amazing resource in regards to releasing, releasing emotions, releasing grief, releasing sadness, releasing anything that your body is holding in, you can release it through meditation. And so just allowing our communities to understand that these resources are not bad. Take the stigma off of these resources so that way we can give our children the proper nutrients because emotional health, you're feeding yourself. Hmm. Um, you need to feed yourself and your children emotionally. And it's not just with discipline. A lot of times we forget we got to give compassion to our children. We have to be tender with our children. We yeah, have to be it. kind with our children. And that tenderness can go such a long way. Even if they're being, you know, combative with us. Sometimes we need to stop and just give them a hug and hold them. And you'll be so surprised if a teenager is just so angry and so upset and you just allow them to release all of those emotions and everything that they've been feeling and holding inside, let them release it. Don't take offense to it. While they're releasing it, believe it or not, they're healing. And in that moment, when they're done, you hug them, embrace them. You let them feel your love. Hmm. And that's something we normally don't do. It took a while for me to get there because I was used to the corporal punishment. I was used to the yelling and the screaming. I was hmm. not used to listening. And when we listen to our children, and we allow them to correct us because we're not perfect. That's true. And we don't have the rule book on how life should go. I allow my daughter to come to me and say, mommy, when you did this, it hurt me. Mommy, when you said this, it bothered me. I have to acknowledge I was wrong and I have to apologize. Taking accountability as a parent is vital to your relationship and the communication and how effective you are with your children. That's going to go a very long way. Um, and then, like I said, more importantly, getting these resources with counseling, whether you choose to go the traditional way and get a psychologist or a psychiatrist, that's your choice. I personally believe holistic counseling is on a different level. And you can connect with the individual more. And sometimes people who get life coaches and they've been in life coaching sessions for a year, but they went to counseling with traditional counselors for 10 years. They're more effective because of the holistic way. So just finding the right resources for your children, as well as you affirming your children, as well as you giving your children compassion and taking accountability for your actions will go such a long way. So based on what you just said now, I feel that a damaged adult or an adult that keeps reliving or replaying the trauma from their childhood or the pains of abuse that they've experienced would not be able to see 
anything wrong with their child. That's my belief because they're blinded by the pain or by whatever they've gone through that they're not seeing that the circle has now begun again. They're doing the same thing that happened to them, to their own child now. And if care is not taken, if the child hasn't got the coping mechanism to cope, they might kill themselves you know for, for instance or the you know or if they don't do that they grow up to be an angry adult who's going to do the same thing all over again so for adults that they still replay all this trauma how do they get you know past this to become better versions of themselves i know you're working with teenagers you're working with you know i work with adults as well I, you work with adults as well oh yeah absolutely so how can we get the adults, you know, to be a better version of themselves? Trust me, I, uh, when, I was, when I looked on social media and you see people commenting about things and you look at the age range of these people cussing, mm-hmm. in a, they can't construct sentences without being abusive. Right. They're not young people. Mm-hmm. They're not it's young a lot of adults. People. It's mm-hmm. all adults. Are you thinking... If adults can be like this, what are they telling the young ones? So, and I know for a fact that it's down to whatever has happened to them. So how can they stop relieving or replaying the traumatic past they have and be a better version of themselves? That's hard. It's a lot of hard work. I personally have experienced it. Um, I relive my trauma every day of my life for years, for decades. And I didn't know. I would have nightmares. I would wake up screaming and fighting in my dream from a dream because of my trauma. I was very aggressive. I was very overwhelming. I was very assertive in ways that I shouldn't have been because of the trauma. But as an adult, a lot of people don't know they're suffering from childhood trauma. A lot of people have something called PTSD and it's post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of people associate PTSD with, um, you know, war veterans or, you know, sometimes people who have been in tumultuous situations and they don't associate it with themselves. Hmm. So when you say reliving the trauma, it's practically PTSD. I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose But from my experience and what the research that I've done, reliving your trauma, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. And what that means is you're basically living in the past. You're not living present. You're not living in today. You don't know how to tell yourself and your inner child you're safe. Hmm. And so anytime someone is reacting in an aggressive, like overly aggressive way, they do not feel safe. They do not feel that they're in an environment or a situation where they're okay. And so the aggressiveness is a defense mechanism. The abuse is a defense mechanism to protect themselves. I tell each and every client of mine, when you start your journey, of healing from childhood trauma, you're going to be triggered more. Hmm. You're going to, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy because the triggers you had in the past, say, for example, if you only had, because for me, I had nightmares like maybe three to five times a night a week. And when I started the healing process, I had nightmares every night. Hmm. How do you get over it? How do you deal with it? I, I, it affected my work. It affected the way I treated my children. It affected my relationships and my friendships. It affected the way I communicated with the public and customer service. You yeah. really have no idea. It affects so many different parts of your life. Yeah. Um, being intentional and being aware and acknowledging, I need help. Seeking the proper help. You may need to check yourself in for treatment. You know, Mm -hmm. some places you can go, depending on the country you live in, depending on the state you live in, and depending on the resources and insurance you have. 
you may be able to check yourself into inpatient treatment. Every person chooses a different route. You may be able to check yourself into a outpatient treatment. Be around other people who've experienced these traumas. There are a lot of resources out there for us today. We didn't have these resources 20 years ago where you can go on mm. YouTube and Google what tra childhood trauma is and look mm. at videos on how you can help yourself heal. If you don't have the resources to for insurance, you can join a Facebook, Facebook group for people who have suffered through childhood trauma. Just be careful on what you attach yourself to. Mm. Um, also, you can start learning how to reaffirm yourself because a lot of people as adults that have been affected by childhood trauma, they have low self-esteem. Mm. And with that low self-esteem, they don't believe their worth. They don't believe their value. So it's so many different aspects of how you're going to get through to learn how to heal. And the process is extremely challenging, extremely. Find life coach. I believe in holistic healing. A lot of traditional medicine does not always help because you can take traditional medication for if it's PTSD, they diagnose you with. If you're diagnosed with bipolar disorder, if you're diagnosed with um, anxiety and depression, you're taking medications and I, sometimes medication is great. I, I, I will never you know, d deter anyone from medication but the medication is not healing the trauma. The medication is healing the side effects of the trauma. And so we need to get to the root of where these emotions and this aggressiveness and this abuse is coming from. Some people are physically abusive, why? Because they saw a physical abuse growing up and it was normal. They don't know that if you punch a wall, that's still domestic violence. They don't know that if they shake someone, that's domestic violence. And so educating yourself, educating the people around you. If you have a spouse and you acknowledge, you know what, I think I might be suffering from childhood trauma. I don't know for sure, but I need to talk to my spouse. Tell your spouse what triggers you. Hmm. Tell your partner when you feel triggered, you need space if that's what you need. If you need your partner to come hug you when you're feeling triggered, tell your partner that. So it's a lot of self-education. It's also having someone who's experienced the trauma to understand where you can relate to them. And that's why I'm transparent about my trauma because when I connect with my clients, they know that what I'm giving them, the information, the process, the tools I'm giving them, I use. Hmm. Psychologists, therapists, they're not allowed by law to be transparent with their clients. And that's the reason I did not take that route because I want to connect. When you have a connection with someone and they can see where you were and where you are, it gives them a different perspective that they can get there as well. I totally agree with what you said because if I'm going to go and seek advice from someone, I want to know if they've been through it before. So for example, someone that hasn't experienced loss is now trying to tell me how to deal, how to grieve. I'm just going to take it with a pinch of salt and ignore whatever they've said, because I'm thinking, seriously, what mm -hmm. do you know? You know, kind of. So I totally agree with that. And based on what you said, and based on um, you're having this client base and, you know, speaking to parents, adults, speaking to teenagers. Are there ways as parents that, you know, parents have abused or caused trauma for their kids unintentionally? You know, they think they have the best interest at heart, but what they've done is done more havoc than good. So are there ways that parents can unintentionally cause more damage for their children? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um there's no guidebook to being a parent. There's no one way that's perfect. Like say, for example, if you go to college, you know you have to study this math the same way the teacher taught you because if you don't, you may not pass. But if you do it exactly the way they teach you, you're, you're on a straight shot to get an A. 
when it when it comes to parenting there's it's no handbook for it so every situation is going to be different not only that every person and every child is different every person experience is different you can have two children that grow up in the same household and each of them will have a different experience with both of their parents one child may say my parents were horrible i hate them the other child may say I had the most loving parents ever. I would do anything for them. So as a parent, what I would suggest is go to counseling. Or if you don't want to go to counseling, find a life coach, someone who can help guide you. Because when you're parenting, you can't see yourself. And sometimes your spouse or your partner can't see, your, see you as a parent either. And if you're wrong. If you have an accountability partner that can guide you and you don't know you've caused trauma to your children, but if you're speaking to a neutral party, they can give you a different perspective to show you how you may have caused trauma to that child. And most importantly, when you do acknowledge that you may have caused unintentional trauma to your children, you have to be accountable, not just to adults, you have to be accountable to your children. If you don't recognize that you're being accountable and you're taking accountability in front of those children, they will never be able to get through that trauma yeah. and then get them the additional services and resources that they need as well. Do family counseling. Life coaches, I know I personally, I have um, family sessions with families where it's a mom, a dad, a child, a sibling. You can do a whole family session, have the children speak separately. You can have the parents speak separately. And then you can have just the children together to speak in regards to their experiences. And that will help you understand which things you should eliminate in regards to disciplinary actions with your children or what you should implement in regards to giving to your children. The, the um, book, I think his name is Gary Chapman in regards to the five love languages. Learning your child's love language is very essential. I have two children. I have one who's a hugger and I have one who hates hugs. Completely two different people. So my child who's a hugger, I give her hugs multiple times throughout the day. My child who is not a hugger, I don't hug him unless he requests a hug. So learning your child is essential as well. You just crack me up by saying you've got a hugger. I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> Even when I do not feel like hugging, I get a hug. <laughs> I, you know, I, you cannot say I don't want a hug. You know, it's, right. it's just them. They, right. they give, seriously, I had to like reiterate that you know, there's COVID out there. Do not give everyone a hug. If not, right. trust me, she hugs everyone. Oh, I'm like, love oh. language could be physical touch. Oh, that so she may feel loved when someone's hugging her. You know, yeah. that could be her primary love language. So now, learning I, the children's love language is essential. And I have one that if you look, hug too much, it goes, oh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Oh. You have to be intentional as parents. If you're not a hugger yourself, you have to consciously yes. hug that child and not be like, ah. Yes. Having yes. said that, <laughs> Tony knows that I am not a hugger. Tony knows. <laughs> it's, I'm a lot better now. I've learned. Right. I've learned. Before, if I'm meeting you for the first time, I remember meeting my, my, my sister's best friend for the first time. And she's heard a lot about me. And she came out of her way to meet up with us so she can meet me. I was there with my sister, my two brothers. And she came trying to give me a hug. I just went like, oh, hello, nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm really close. <laughs> she was looking at me like, and can she hugging my brothers? Hugging my... I'm like, no, hello, nice to meet you. Like, not right. in my personal space, kind of. Right. And, you know, it, it was, um, till today, my siblings make fun of me about that. They're like, you. You don't know people. I'm like, no, no, I've changed. I've changed, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I think later on, she understood the kind of person I was, that it didn't mean that I didn't appreciate her leaving her house to right. come and meet me. It's just that I'm not a hogger. But guess what? 
I gave her a hug. Now, if I should see her today, I would yes. give her a hug because I've changed from, you know. Right, right. So, and so just as an adult, you know that experience. So imagine being a child. And I still, you know, I still, I'm working on it where because my son is not a hugger, he doesn't want to be around people. He doesn't like being around. It's just, that's who he is. And so, because I'm a hugger, my daughter's a hugger, we just want to hug everybody. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but just learning those balances and not overstepping those boundaries is very uh -huh. important. Uh -huh. I totally agree. I think as parents, we have to be very, very intentional about, you know, what we do, how we do it. Um, I remembered um, a while back, you know, when we're talking about what our own experience and everything is. And I have, my mom was around and she was, um, she had a conversation with my girls and she was telling, I've got three girls and she was telling them about, oh, uh, your mom wouldn't do this. Your mom wouldn't do that. Your mom wouldn't do this. And I said to her, I said, yeah, I wouldn't do that because that was how you want us to be. Mm -hmm. But I said for her, they would do this, but they know if they go beyond this, there's a repercussion. It's not necessarily smacking or anything no it's, right they know what the repercussion for doing something is we sit down together have a chat about things it's amazing that these kids have got ideas when you say to them oh you didn't do this or your teacher said you, you're meant to do this but you didn't do it what do you think should happen to you when they come up with what they want you to do for them you would laugh trust yeah. me you yeah. would laugh and it's most times actually better than whatever idea you got you thought, in your right. you thought it was right. <laughs> Seriously, I just find that out. So now yeah. I was at this conversation with, oh, you didn't do this. So what do you think should happen now? And they'll come up with stuff and you're thinking, oh, actually that sounds better than what I've got in my head. I'm right. just go with it. <laughs> Not this seriously, uh, growing yeah. up, we didn't have the opportunity to talk no. to our parents. No. It was an order. We don't, you know, exactly. you don't have an opinion. So mm -hmm. now if we take that style of parenting and use that for our children, we're just going to find that we've lost them. We lost them. So in our old age, we have kids that don't want to see us or want to talk to us because we, did, we didn't keep that communication gap going throughout the years. We didn't communicate. It was more of an order to them all the time. And so, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, another very important tip really quickly is have you allow your children to be able to come to you and tell you something that even if it's going to make you upset, have a key word, say pineapples is your cold. Your child comes to you and say pineapples, you know, pineapples mean they're going to tell you something that's going to upset you, but you cannot react in that manner. You have to listen to them. True. True. So uh, I, I, I agree with you. We, we don't have safe, but we have something they will tell you, um, they'll tell you mommy i'm about to say the truth when right. they say i'm about to say the truth you know that right. it's something and they know no matter how bad whatever they've done is as long as it's the truth right i'm like a mom mama bear mm -hmm. if my child should come home from school and tell me she's been picked on for something as long as she's told me and it's the truth i go out of my way right i don't mind taking the day off work to go right. in and start it out so right. with me it has to they have to always like say the truth. They have to exactly. always tell me the truth, even if I don't want to hear or even if it's, exactly. not, it's, it's not nice. I still want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I was going to point out, does it make sense for an adult? You know, we've got busy life and whatever, whatever. And I know in schools, they have a, how do I call it? Is it a, they have safeguarding measures, but they have an adult that, a child can go to report to, I've forgotten what the word they use um, to, to call these people it's like they're they're not counselors but they're like their go-to person if their class teacher or whatever form, form teacher is not available or if their parents are not there when a situation happens so they're like the first contact to go and say stuff with. so as parents does it make sense having that for example um my husband, for example, does, he doesn't have his siblings in the UK. We live in the UK. He doesn't have his siblings living with me. I've got all my siblings living with me. But even at me having all my siblings living with me, I've got two of my siblings that I gave my first daughter their numbers. If I'm not available, your dad is not available, stick to them. 
the reason I did that is I found out that sometimes they want to tell us something that happened now and we're not there. Yes. So does it make sense to kind of have that same, but knowing who you're putting in place? Absolutely. As well, does it make sense having that kind of thing going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, my children know if they can't contact me or they can't have a conversation with myself or their father, then they can go to their godmother. And my daughter has her phone number. Um, the phone, her phone, my, my uh, best friend's phone number is on the emergency contact at school as well. And so if it's a crisis, say, for example, if your child have a panic attack at school and you work an hour away and your spouse or your partner works 30 minutes away, but the person you designate is only 10 minutes away, then it's more reasonable for that person who is 10 minutes away to get to your child to help calm them out of that panic attack than myself who's an hour away or my spouse or partner who's 30 minutes away. So it's very important. Yeah. So it's just putting it out there for parents to know that, yeah, they should have one person at least that yes. if they're not available, this person can actually... Because at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm not praying to die, but I, I just thought about it. Yeah. If, I, if I'm sure. not, if, if I die or my husband dies, God forbid, but life happens and the kids right. are there, who can they go to? You know, just start thinking in that line. I, exactly. Please give me that look again. Please, <laughs> <laughs> <Same. laughs> I get, I get what you're saying, what um, AJ is saying as well, just to, you know, create safe environment for kids and right. someone, make them feel safe. Who, who, who are they safe with if you're not there? You know, creating that safety net for them all the time. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And that'll give them the ability to be more open and more truthful with you. You know, I have conversations with my children about everything especially my daughter, she's 14. I talk to her about everything and I don't hold anything back. And just being open to that, you know, you may have a child that come to you and say, you know what, mommy, I like boys and girls. Um, I don't know what to do about that. Having that open dialogue with that child is so essential at that point because children hide things as well. And when a child is hiding something, then that's when their self-esteem goes down. And that's where a lot of other challenges come in. And then that's where sadness and depression gets taken over. That child gets taken over by it. So being open to letting your child tell you anything in a respectful manner is appropriate. But being defensive when your child is telling you you're doing something wrong. that is harming them and is causing trauma and you're just defending it with all costs is not going to help. Or saying, I'm the mom here. I feel the abuse. <laughs> exactly. That, oh, I grew up. Do what I say, not what I do. Yeah. I'm the mom here. I can tell you to do that. You can't question me. You know? Right. <laughs> right. Like we say back home, I brought you into this world. I can take, I can you, take you out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good one. That's yes. <laughs> That's a favorite one of my mom. Yes, actually, I've which, heard that several times myself. Which so. makes me laugh. So yes. when it's your birthday, we have a thing in my house. On that day, you can get away with mother. So that's it. When is your birthday? My birthday is September 6th. <laughs> but my mom would not turn around and say to you, birthday or not birthday, I will give you a work. <laughs> <laughs> you're thinking, you're the one that says that's one day that I can get away with anything. And then uh -huh. you're turning around telling me I'm going to go work. You know, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just, um, it's funny in a way. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like I give it to you I take it mm -hmm. back <laughs> yep. yep so I've got one one last question sure. you know I like the fact that when we started this conversation you said because of COVID um you've not been able to meet physically but you've come up with new stuff so and I know that you're trying to empower people you empower the young adults the teenagers and the adults as well uh you know to become a better version of themselves to rise above whatever traumatic experience they might have. It's not that we, it's not that you're saying that it didn't happen, but you know, how to cope, how to be a better version of themselves. 
you know, and how to come out victorious in a way. So in the next five to ten years, what vision do you see for, you know, Survivor Not By Chance LFC? What vision do you see for this going forward? Going forward, um, it's not just a vision. It's something I'm actually going to do. I'm in the process of working through it and getting there. And so my primary goal is to be able to completely and continually educate my community in regards to um, mental health, um, educating my community in regards to changing their mindsets, educating my community in regards to how they view life, being an advocate for childhood trauma, continually being an advocate for domestic violence. And I want to start building communities, not just having a conversation over virtual Zoom or you know, having a conversation in a school or a community events because I've been doing that. But now we need to move forward and create these safe environments. And when I say create these safe environments, I want to create a, um, I want to uh, buy a house. And the house that I wanna buy, it needs to be really huge because I want it to be where it's a shelter for families that are coming in who have to leave domestic violence situations. Mm -hmm. And if a mother feels she has no resource and nowhere to go, how is she's gonna, how is she's gonna live? How is she's going to um, feed her children? I want my safe haven to be an escape for these people. And when they come, we're going to educate them. We're going to reaffirm them. We're going to build them up and we're going to teach them how to live independently. We're going to teach them how to grow and be great parents. We're going to teach them how to progress and move forward with life. Um, I'm also doing quite a few different um I'm working on doing some master classes to give people um, information on how they can get their stories out there. Um, educating people that even though you write your trauma down does not mean you have to publish it. Mm. You don't. Writing is very impactful. You know, just giving people these tools and um, building community because when you're building, even if it's a small community of people, say if I have only five families in this home and I have a 10 bedroom um, house and say five bathrooms and it's five families there with a couple of different children, I'm inputting my energy and my positivity into these families. And I'm gonna have staff around me that's gonna do the same and put these positive affirmations and things into these families. And we're gonna do this globally. And we're gonna basically find different locations and basically continually build up our communities. Hmm. We do have places now where there are qu quite a few different shelters. There are quite a few different places but people go to shelters and then they go right back home. Mm. Why? They're not being fed. And so, feeding the mind is completely different than feeding your body. Hmm. And so I wanna be that resource where I'm giving to my community in multiple different ways. And I'm teaching my community generational wealth. I'm teaching them how to use their skills and their tools and to hone into what they're great at. Um, and so I know I'm a healer. I know I'm an educator. I know that's my calling. I know that's what I'm gonna do. I have quite a few different books that I'm in the process of trying to get out there as well. Um, but I do definitely know, I, I don't vision it, I know Without a doubt, these things are necessary. These are things that I have to do, not for myself, but for those people out there who just, it may be a mother who says, you know what, I can't, I, I'm giving up, I'm done. And if she see a commercial on TV that has the homeless shelter, or I may not even call it a homeless shelter, I may call it something completely different, but a holistic place she can go to as an escape of her trauma. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. But it's it's been a wonderful time speaking to you. Thank you. Me. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful. I can spend the whole day just talking about child trauma because 
to be honest, I've seen, I keep referring back to social media. I think the, the, the social media being popular now shows that we've got a society that's sick. You know, yes, we've got a society that is really, really sick. And the only way we can, you know, heal it, the society, heal the community is by starting, like you're saying, you, if you take five family, for example, from a particular area, and you help them, those five family will go out there and have an impact, even if it's just one family that they right. come in contact with, they have an impact on those family. And before you know it, it makes the world a better place. And like you, your analogy of um, a cup on that a thick dripping, yeah, it might be just dripping, but in time, with time, it fills the cup and makes it, and the cup runs over. Thank you so much, um, Aisha, from for coming on. We, we oh, so you're much welcome. Enjoyed, you're welcome. So much enjoy speaking to you. And, Thank you. And from the things I've picked up, you know, being intentional about parenting, knowing the love languages of our children, you know, um, setting barriers as well. And then not letting fear hold us back, you know, getting help when we need it. Don't think, to be honest, I, from our part of the world, I'm a Nigerian and I know, for example, people don't, if now people are trying, actually trying, but before now, people don't really sort of seek counseling. They'll tell you it's not an African thing to go for counseling. I've heard that before. And mm -hmm. if they can't go for counseling, some people will end up going to their church. Mm -hmm. And the thing is this, yes, there's a, you know, position of uh, religion, but also if you do not speak to someone that's actually a professional or someone that's actually gone through that capacity mm -hmm. thing you're trying to like get counselling from, you're just going to feel more burdensome. You feel yes. like nothing has been done. So I, I practically, I've taken it so many, you can see me in my pen. I'm frightened as <laughs> you're talking as well. And I know Tola's got, let me tell you a secret, Tola's got a big notebook every session. And I know she's got like pages and pages of stuff that she's written down. Yes, I think I think we need to come together one day and just put lessons <laughs> learned. I just start like putting lessons learned, on, you know, I guess it's, it's session. But you know what? This has been a very, very interesting time with you, interesting chat. Like I said, it's not questioning, it's chat. So yeah, so no, I, I appreciate it. Way. Thank you so much. I think oh. one, one thing that I just want to say again is thanks for that book, Survive, um, Becoming Diamond. Thank yes, you. The pressures of becoming the a diamond. Of becoming diamond. Becoming, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. You said it's about your story in that book. Mm -hmm. And as you said, not everyone is, you know, ready to share. Thank you right. for sharing. That's going to really help someone that picks it up. So can you give us a sneak peek into that book? Someone's listening. Sure. Why should I get the book? Is it something worth my time to read? <laughs> sure. Um, if you don't mind, I can read a few, um, not pages, because I know we're like short on time, but yeah. like a, a couple paragraphs really quickly, okay. um, just to give you a glimpse of, um, my experience. And so I just want to quickly explain to you all the reason I chose the title. Okay. So diamonds are a valuable jewel. Mm -hmm. Most women want diamonds. Like I don't know a woman that does not want a diamond. Men <laughs> want diamonds as well. They get these Rolex watches drizzled in all kinds of diamonds and jewels. It is valuable. We love diamonds, but what people forget about how beautiful diamonds are is there is a extensive pressuring process that they go through. And it's a lot of steam, a lot of fire, a lot of harsh yeah. things being done to this diamond before you see the finished product. Yeah. And so you know, I wanted to choose something that I knew represented me. And I have had a whole lot of pressures. <laughs> I've had quite a few experiences that were pressuring to kind of, so if you put too much pressure, you can destroy it hmm. or you can put cracks in it, but then you have to kind of fine tune it out. So like to shine it up. 
And so that's my life. That has been my entire life experience. And so it's a lot of people who are under so many pressures, yeah. so many challenges, so many trials, so many traumas, and they don't know it's trauma. Yeah. They don't know the experiences. It's something called a ACE questionnaire or ACE test. It's advanced childhood experience. And so, I'm sorry, adverse childhood experiences. I took this test and I'm thinking, okay, I have a traumatic childhood. You can, the highest score you can get is a 10, which is the worst. The lowest score you can get is a one or a zero. Mm -hmm. I took the score, I took the test and I got a 10 out of a 10, which is the worst score you can get. And I didn't even know I was affected by trauma so much. And so I knew I needed to heal. And this was literally uh, a few years ago. I knew I needed to heal. And so writing this book was an example of me healing. Yeah. So let me give you all a quick glimpse. Let me see. Okay. So I'll read part of chapter four. Tasha had been around drugs her whole life. By the time she was in sixth grade, she could identify when Ruby was high. Tasha would come home from school and find Ruby passed out on the couch from being high. Ruby began to get careless with getting high. Sometimes she would light the crack pipe on the stove in the kitchen while Tasha was in the house. The smell of the crack cooking was a distinct smell. It was thick, burning, musty smell that Tasha would never forget. Ruby never really worked. She would attend job training programs because of the requirements for the welfare program. Ruby dropped out of high school when she was in ninth grade. She didn't even get a GED or diploma. So it was hard for her to find a job. Ruby relied on the assistance from the government for money, food stamps and apartments. But Ruby and Tasha, I'm sorry, Ruby had Tasha when she was able to get the assistance. Tasha thought Ruby was extremely beautiful. Ruby was five foot 11, 180 pounds, light skinned with curly black, blonde hair. Ruby had the most beautiful light brown eyes that changed, to gray, that changed to gray sometimes. Tasha wished she was beautiful as her mother. Tasha would look in the mirror, imagining her skin was lighter and she had light brown eyes. Tasha did not think she was beautiful because she was constantly reminded of how she looked just like her father. Tasha hated being brown skinned. Tasha knew she was treated differently by her family and friends because she was a darker skinned girl. When Tasha was a young girl, she was teased about her hair and her complexion. Tasha hated that her hair was coarse and that she had that her relaxers did not last long as her friends Ruby never sent Tasha to the hair salon to get her hair done. Most of the time, Tasha did her hair herself to the best of her ability. Lucky enough for her, she learned how to braid at an early age. Every time Ruby would smoke inside the house, the entire house was engulfed with the musty, burning smell. It made her cringe. It was strong. It was such a strong odor. But there was nothing Tasha could do about it. Tasha would secretly look at Ruby's nails to determine if she recently got high. If Ruby's nails were discolored or black, Tasha knew Ruby just finished getting high. Sometimes Ruby would wash her hands with bleach to disguise the fact that she was getting high, but Tasha could tell the difference. Bang, bang, bang. Tasha pounded on the door for Ruby to come out and open it. Who knocking on my door like that, said Ruby. It's me, Ma, open the door, Tasha yelled through the door. Ruby had four locks on the door. Tasha could hear the clicks of the locks from the outside of the door as Ruby opened the door. Tasha, you don't have to bang on my door like that. What's wrong with you, Ruby said. Tasha didn't say much besides yes, ma'am. Tasha walked into the apartment following Ruby. The apartment was small, the walls were plain white, no decorations, no pictures. 
Tasha and Ruby moved a lot, so there was no need to decorate. The room had one pullout couch. Tasha slept on a pullout couch and Ruby slept in the only one bedroom apartment. The apartment had a small kitchenette about 50 square feet. The bathroom was extremely small as well, about 25 square feet. Ruby put up a shower curtain in the bathroom and a mat on the floor for the shower. Tasha noticed there was a man sitting on the pullout couch where she was in the, the living room. Ruby said, this is my friend, Frank. Hi, young lady, you're very pretty, Frank said. Thank you, Ruby said in an uncomfortable tone. That's just a glimpse. Wow. It, yes. It's so like, much like more. Passion, giving a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually listening yeah. and I didn't want that to end. Yeah. So Tasha is my character. Um, I changed the names. I've changed the scenes. I've changed the dynamics of how everything actually flowed in my life to protect the identity of most people who may have encountered with me or may have had any place in my life. I never wanted anyone to feel as if I was singling them out or make anyone feel as if I was like diminishing who they were as an individual person. And so in the book, I share quite a few different challenges. I share quite a few different things that like with colorism. You know, I'm not a darker brown skinned girl, but I'm a brown skinned girl. And my mother is light skinned. We never met her father. Um, but from what family members tell us, my mother's father is white. But we don't know, you know, looking at me, you would never know that. And so I experienced colorism at an early age. You know, I was told my hair was just nappy. My hair was super nappy and nobody wanted to do my hair. It was just disgusting. And so I internalized that. Yeah. I internalized being ugly. I internalized looking like a man. You know, you could tell your children they look like their parents. But when you constantly tell a little girl she looks like a man, that can be damaging. You know, so I, 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 I literally would look in the mirror and wish my skin was light like my mother's. I wish my hair was soft and like curly, like my mother's, you know, I wished my eyes were light, like my mother's. I knew the light skinned girls, they got everything they wanted and they can just be nasty and mean and they can just still get whatever they wanted. But for me, mm. I was just the sweetest little girl and I didn't get anything and I couldn't understand why. And so I internalized so much. And so affirmations is super, super important when it comes to educating your children and their family. Oh, give give my girls a hug food. now after this and just call them and give them random hugs. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I bet they think, what is wrong with mommy? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, one thing I'm grateful for is initially when I wrote this book, I wrote a completely different book the first time around. Oh. Um, and I had some unforeseen situations happen with the company I was working with and I had to start over. And I literally sold like 20, almost 30 copies of my book on pre-sale. I was determined to get my book out to give to my customers because it was very essential that I, I am a woman of my word. I don't believe in going against what I tell people. Hmm. So I would say my grandmother passed away. October, I'm sorry, August 18th. No, August 14th, we found out my grandmother had a stroke and she was unresponsive. And she was in the hospital for four days. And she passed away on the 18th. We wow. buried her on the 28th. And she was literally one of the only persons, one of the only people in my world that, so as an adult, I knew she would always be there for me, regardless of what I looked like, what I did, how I spoke unconditionally and it was hard because every year she would send me a birthday card it she you know my grandma was 91 years old every year she sent me a birthday card she never forgot and when she died my right a month before my birthday I thought oh last year was the last card I would ever get from her she already had a card prepared to mail to me with the stamp on it before she died that just shows how much love she had for me. And so it was so hard for me to get through writing my book. And so I had to start writing all over again, no, uh, September 10th. Mm. 
-hmm. I wrote from a completely different perspective, another completely part of my life. And I literally poured my soul into this book. Mm -hmm. 30 days, I wrote, edited, and published my book by myself. Wow. And I was a little nervous about it because I'm like, I did everything myself. It's going to be some, you know, challenges, some errors. It's, you know, the format, it may not be the perf perfect formatting. I don't have a publisher. I don't have a publicist. I don't know how this is going to work. But I put my intentions in the book hmm. as I wrote. And my intent was to help heal people, to help people see that regardless of your experiences, you can still be successful. And I'm grateful to God that every person that's read my book, as soon as they picked it up, they could not put it down. My, my other grandmother, she lives um, like a thousand miles away from me. And she's 80 years old. I sent her a copy of my book. She read it multiple times. Aww, nice. And she's not a reader. Like she doesn't just pick up a book and say, oh, let me read this book. <laughs> she read it multiple times. Every other person that I've interacted with that's purchased it on Amazon or purchased it from me directly have loved the book and they're waiting for the next one. And every person can finish it within a day or two. Um, it's an easy read. You literally learn so much about yourself. Um, I, this man purchased my book in Norway. And originally we purchased each other's books to give each other reviews. When I say he was affected by what I wrote and he experienced some of the same things I experienced in a completely different part of the world, that shows you how impactful this book is. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend this book for teenagers from the age of 14 and up. Mm -hmm. And especially for adults, because we have so many things that's happened to me in this book that's happened to other adults. And they're like, oh, yeah, that happens to everybody. No, it does not. And it's not normal. So getting this book is essential to doing something called shadow work or doing something called inner child work. Whatever you call it, it's essential because it's going to help push you into your destiny. Amen. We have to round up now, I guess. That's amazing, sure. though. That's such an amazing. I think we should have put this first. To let people know how amazing the book is, but yeah, we you know we save the best for the last. Thank and you. Thank you for sharing. And I have to say that you are, I can tell you have a gorgeous heart and you yeah. have a wonderful spirit just by the things that you want to do to help people. Apart from also being a very beautiful young woman, because I can tell you're not using lots of makeup, right? And thank you. No. <laughs> no makeup. <laughs> I don't know how you get that skin. I'm going to probably, you know, text you later. <laughs> <with you. laughs> Thank you. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. Liz, anything you want to add before I wrap, wrap up? Uh, do, uh, we have, do we have any questions on people watching the face? Or? None today. None today. Cool. And if I can just let people know, they can find me um, on Facebook. Uh, survivor not by chance they can find me on instagram survivor not by chance um my website is www.survivor not by chance.com um, my book is on amazon the pressures of becoming a diamond if you are interested in life coach services please reach out to me directly i am trying to be very responsive i have a personal assistant now so it makes things a lot easier <laughs> um but I, I am, I, I'm, I'm driven, literally driven and passionate about helping people. It's not something that I'm doing to just create generational wealth or create income. This is something that I love doing. And it, I don't care what part of the world you're from. My first client was in the U United Can Kingdom. So I have a special love <laughs> for the UK. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> oh, amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. And for everyone that's been part of this wonderful journey where every week, well, not every week, <laughs> but every fortnightly, we bring you someone that, you know, uh, will share with us and will inspire us to be a better version of ourselves. So today, Charlie, can you do the honor of thanking our guests? 
Oh yeah, thank you everyone. God, big, big God bless you. And just go out there and keep being better, keep being um, a, a better version of who you are and keep being special and work on becoming a diamond as well. Thank you, Aisha. Um, Aisha, thanks for joining us and hope we can have you back. You know, we'd like to have you back. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll have you back at some other dates in the future. So thanks, guys. God bless you. It's been a wonderful episode today on inspirational moments. And we're grateful to God for life. So Godspeed. And we have um, a fantastic guest coming at the end of the month. So watch out for that. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye.